Now, before we investigate active first order filters, let's have a look at the amplification through an operational amplifier first. An ideal operational amplifier has no input current at neither of its input, not in the non-inverting input and not at the inverting input. Furthermore, the voltage across those two nodes is always zero volts. So Vn minus Vp is zero. In the circuit diagram over here, we have the current for the inverting input on this branch and the input current of the non-inverting input is down here. The voltage, which is zero, is across those two nodes. So that's the voltage out here. Furthermore, the input impedance is infinite and the output impedance is zero ohm. The input impedance is the one that we are seeing when we are looking in here and we measure the voltage, which is zero, divided by the current, which is also zero. And the output impedance is the resistor at the output of the operational amplifier, which is zero. Furthermore, we assume an infinite gain of the voltage transfer function from the differential input voltage to the output voltage of the op amp. Now with the conditions of the operational amplifier in place, we can actually create a circuit with it and apply a feedback impedance set two and an input impedance set one to the inverting amplifier circuit. That leaves us with the input voltage of the two port on the left hand side and the output voltage on the right hand side. The input voltage is applied from one terminal to the other. That means we have the input voltage here, but we also have it over there. And as there is zero voltage difference between the two inputs here, we can define a virtual ground up here and we can see that the input voltage is actually applied across the input impedance set one. With the current through that impedance, we can rewrite the input voltage as the current through the impedance times the impedance itself. As we have no current flowing into the operational amplifier, the current through set one also flows through set two. And that is the current that shows up in Ohm's law down here. Now the output voltage is applied from one terminal here to the other terminal down there. We can also follow the potential of the terminal down here all the way over to the input of the operational amplifier. And again, as we don't have any voltage across the inputs, we can follow the voltage all the way up here to this node, and we end up having the output voltage across set two. But this time, the output voltage is applied the other way across the impedance set two than the current that is flowing through it. Ohm's law across that impedance, taking the current flow into account, is written down here, where the current is the exact same current as we had for defining the input voltage. In the final step to derive the transfer function of that circuit, we divide the output voltage with the input voltage and we end up with minus set two divided by set one for the transfer function of an inverting amplifier. For a non-inverting amplifier, we can use the same conditions at the input of the operational amplifier and also for the impedances and the gain of the operational amplifier, as long as it's ideal. The input voltage is still across the input terminals, 
and we have the output voltage as the output voltage of the operational amplifier to ground, which is the same voltage as the voltage across the series connection of Z1 and Z2. As the current that is flowing into the inverting terminal of the op-amp is zero, and the voltage across its input terminals is also zero, the only relevant current is flowing through the impedance divider of Z2 and Z1. The input voltage over here is ending up at the bottom of Z2, and as the start of that voltage arrow, is connected to the non-inverting input of the amplifier, which has the same electrical potential as the inverting input of the operational amplifier, we have the input voltage being applied across the impedance of Z2. Therefore, Ohm's law across the impedance Z2 gives us an expression for the input voltage. And the output voltage is directly applied across Z1 and Z2. And the current through both of them is the same current as the one we just used in the expression for the input voltage. So we can express the output voltage of that circuit as the current times the impedances where that current is flowing through. Dividing those two voltages with each other gives us the voltage transfer function of the non-inverting amplifier circuit with an ideal operational amplifier. 1 plus Z2 divided by Z1. If we now replace the impedances Z1 and Z2 with components and their series and parallel connections, we can, for example, build an inverting load pass by using R1 as the impedance Z1 and the parallel connection of a capacitor and R2 for the feedback impedance. Inserting those impedances into the transfer functions that we have just derived, for example, for the inverting amplifier, it was minus Z2 divided by Z1, we get now the parallel connection of R2 and C divided by R1, and we have the minus in front of it. And we can rewrite that expression into the characteristic polynomials in the denominator for the low pass, and we have a DC gain now in front of it. We can do the same thing for a non-inverting low pass, and here I refer you to this homepage, which describes that circuit. For an inverting high pass, we replace Z1 with the series connection of a resistor and a capacitor, and the feedback impedance is a resistor only. Again, dividing the impedance of the resistor, R2, with the impedance of the series connection of R1 and the capacitor gives us the characteristic transfer function of a high pass. Now with the minus sign in front of it as it's inverting. And once more, we can adjust the gain now for frequencies approaching infinity by the ratio of R2 divided by R1. For a non-inverting low pass, you can find information and the circuit on this homepage. Active filters can also be built as second order filters and higher order filters. A very specific and generic kind of active filter for second order filters is the so-called cell and key filter. You can find a description of the cell and key filter on Wikipedia, and there are further links where you can explore the cell and key filter. Now, in some of the cell and key filter implementations, you can use the non-inverting part of the amplifier simply with two resistors to adjust the DC gain, 
and the generic impedances Z1, 2, 3, and 4 of the inverting part of the amplifier can be configured with resistors and capacitors in a way to get the desired high-pass, low-pass, band-pass, or band-stop behavior.